one of the items that I saw ages ago um, was about depreciation values on a car, and it was for sixth grade. And the math, sixth or seventh grade, it was, and the math was appropriate, but the concept was not. Sixth graders could care less about the depreciation value when buying a car. They care if it's red and cool and sporty. You know what I mean? They, they, they're not relating to that context. I know this from when I write application kinds of questions. I try them out on the people who live with me because they're my guinea pigs. And um, true story, um, Gabby, who's my second grader now, that's kind of hard to say, um, we were doing, I was writing real world problems for first grade, and I said, what are you guys collecting? <laughs> she said, Zoobles. And I said, oh, what the heck is a Zooble? Because she goes, we have some. I didn't buy it for her, because I don't even know what they are. But there are these marbles that have zoo animals in them. So I get it, Zoobles. So I said, okay, I'm going to write some problems about Zoobles. So I made a whole thing about that context of collections of Zoobles. And she said, can I take this to school for my class? Because they'd like to do this, because everybody loves Zoobles. Yeah, sure, she, and her teacher's cool with that, too. They're clearful where they put my kids, I think. <laughs> 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 um, so she is a teacher who's really good at putting up. I mean, she brought it to school and the class liked, you know, the Zoobles exercise. And then I said, She's like, we're going to make more Zoobel problems. I said, you can make problems about anything. Why don't you have the kids come up with problems that aren't about Zoobels, but about something else? Because they will relate to it, and they like it. I, I mean, when does a kid say, can I have this worksheet in my class? I mean, that's not normal. But they relate it to that, that application context. And I think that's part of our challenge is give them the equation and say, you come up with the context. Because we come up, we're making all the connections to the world for them if we always come up with the context. But we, we have them come up with the context. I think that's the level of rigor we're going for. When they ask, what am I ever going to use? You know, I don't know. For homework tonight, go interview four people and ask them when they use fractions. You tell me. And come back tomorrow and say, when will I use fractions as an adult? Because that's a good question. I don't know. I, I can't predict your life. But go talk to other people. That's better than us telling them, well, you'll use it here and you'll use it there. I love how we used to say, next year, you're going to use this next year, right? Because we didn't always know where they're going to use it. So the types of standards are that we have those procedural skill and fluency expectations, we have the conceptual and we have the applications. And I think when we look at the easiest ones to tackle, the procedural skill and fluency expectations are simpler if they have the concept. They're simpler to teach. I think that's why we're in a hurry to get to them, because we just show you how to do it. Conceptual expectations are more challenging to teach, but they should happen first so that the procedures can be easy and that they can do the procedures with understanding. And then applications, those are much more rigorous because we're saying take those concepts and procedures, bring them all together, and apply it in a real world context. So those are our types of expectations. And I, I think what Park is telling us is that they want to have problems that are worth doing. They're multi-step problems, conceptual questions, applications, and substantial procedures will be common as in an excellent classroom. They're trying to make an assessment that should mirror the instruction that's going on. They're trying. It's not easy to do with some of the expectations that are put on it, but they're trying. And I think they're doing a decent job most of the time. You know, when I look at some of the items, there are, there are some of the items we were looking at, and I was like, God, can't we bring in some more technology? And they said, well, we made all the fun ones. We're trying to come up with some items for the backup plan for the districts that might not have the technology in place. Hmm. Oh, well, then they're not going to be as rich, because it's hard to do a paper and pencil-based assessment that's conceptual. It's not as easy. So it, they're doing the best they can with the situation. But I think it's better than what we have right now. It's definitely better than the guys said. So the idea of focus from PARC is that they're not you know, randomly sampling a whole bunch of topics. The PARC framework is focused just like the standards are. They're going to have more questions on the green. They're going to have less questions on the blue and the yellow. Claim A is the green. Claim B is the blue and the yellow. But they're going to have questions on the blue and the yellow, so don't skip them. Just don't spend as much time on them, and there won't be as many questions on them. A lot of the integrated expectations in the blueprint bring all those, the blue, the yellow, and the green together. So we see the connection. Um, but the idea is that going deep, because they're trying to mirror what they 
want to have happen in the classroom. They want it to be focused. They want your instruction to be focused. They want questions that will cause kids to see the connections between standards, which is why they have integrated statements, evidence statements, where you're not just assessing one standard or a piece of a standard. You're going to assess a few standards at a time or a cluster of standards. Now, those are those are based off of the standards, but they're not the language of the standards, and they're a little bit more open to interpretation. Um, and I think those are some of the ones that they're trying to refine to be a little bit clearer in their descriptions, but they don't want to be too clear so that it limits the type of question. Um, the integrate, I think some of those integrated expectations, sometimes when I read it, you know, and I look at a question, I think it does, the item does match the evidence statement, but I don't feel that it matches the standards that are encompassed in the evidence statement. And I think that's where the struggle is. We have to stick true to what the standards, the, you know, what's the core idea of that standard? Just because it matches the evidence statement doesn't make it a good fit. So that's where I think that challenge is gonna be. Um, okay, there's three types of items on the pile. Type one items, these are, um, they could be conceptual, procedural, um, or application, they're machine scorable. They would, any practice is kind of fair game. They're trying to click into the practices that are most closely tied to that, the standards. And they will appear on both the end of year and the performance-based assessment. So those type ones are, are um, totally machine scorable, okay? The type two assessments, there they go. Those are the ones that um, require they're really getting at practice um, three, the constructing an argument, the justification. Those are both machine scorable and hand scorable. They might be some click drag build where the diagram or the or the you know virtual tool that they use is their justification. Um, they might be hand scored because there's some kind of a written explanation. So there, there's a merger, there's a blend of those. They're really zeroing in on practice three and practice six because they want to see them using the precise language in their arguments. Um, those are going to be on the performance-based assessment, the one that's 75% of the way through the year. And then the type threes, um, those are the modeling. Those are the real rich task, real world applications. Those are also machine and hands global. They're trying to get at practice four, the idea of using the models. And those are also on the performance-based assessment. So a lot of the um, a lot of the conceptual and application expectations are going to be on the type two and the type three assessments, which are only on the performance based assessment because they're more open ended. Where we're seeing the procedural skill and fluency type things, those are more on the end of year assessment. If you go through those evidence tables, um, I actually went through them and kind of highlighted, you know, the green, yellow, the blue, to see, and that's where I matched them up to the model curriculum. And I went through our model curriculum scope and sequence said, okay, PPA, EOY, which ones are where? I want to make sure everything that's on the PPA is in the first three quarters of the year because otherwise we're not adequately preparing and the model won't work. That's why we're looking at changing Map 1 because the model won't prepare them quite enough for the PPA. If we shift a couple things around, I think it's going to be fine. So I don't think it's going to be dramatic change for Map 1, but it's going to change. Be patient, <laughs> just a little bit. Okay, I think all of this relates to these modes of representation, where we're seeing the use of manipulatives or tools, pictures and graphs, tables and charts, symbols, equations, inequalities, oral written language, and their world situations. The key to all this is that it's not just that they have one mode, but when you have a conceptual expectation, would you expect them to flow between and among those different? I think that's where our, our standards are really coming to life. Now when I start explaining things to parents, this is where I start, is that it used to be we taught you how to do this one way, in one mode of representation. And if you had that one way, we were happy and we moved on to the next topic. Where the depth and complexity is coming in is that we're not stopping at one mode of representation. We want multiple modes of representation. So if your kid has only one mode, we're not going to stop. We're gonna keep going until your kid has several modes. And that's where the depth and complexity comes from. Parents are getting that. Once they understand this idea that, so, you know, for my kid to really deeply understand, they should be able to do it multiple ways. That's a good thing. We're not saying that 
they need to be dependent upon manipulatives and tools. We're saying that if they're shown manipulatives and tools, they recognize what concept is going on there. They can connect that manipulative model or that picture model to the symbols. If they don't see the connection between them, they don't really understand it as deeply as they should. <coughs> so that's one of the key pieces that I think parents are starting to shift over to say, oh, I like these new standards. I didn't learn it that way. I wish someone had taught me that way. And we hear that a lot. I think some of us say that. I wish I was taught with multiple <laughs> modes of representation when I was in, you know, I'm remembering algebra two trick. It was very symbolic for me. I, I don't think I had a deep enough understanding of it. I, you know, and I loved, I mean, I remember calculus, I loved calculus. But now I think back, I learned how to do calculus. I don't know that I totally got it. I, now that I think back to it, it's, it's kind of half of it's gone. Okay, but don't use it anymore, right? Okay, oops. Real life situations. This one is really the heart of it all. If we don't get them to the real world situation level, that's the modeling piece. That's the application piece. At the high school level, these are denoted by the stars after the standards, that if we don't connect it to the real world, they don't see the point in doing it. And I think we weren't doing that enough historically. They would ask us, when are you gonna use, you know, when are we gonna use this? And we'd say next year. You know, we didn't we didn't always know when we were gonna use it. Where it's plain <coughs> to see where they have to do applications because they talk about real world problems. And sixth through twelfth grade, real world problems are in lots of your standards. So you know it's an application expectation because we're connecting to the world. And at the high school level, we're also seeing connections where there's looking at theoretical proof because we're connecting math to math. Use math to prove math. That's also a type of application. But, but it's easier to start picking out these expectations now that we know what to look for. So real world is huge. Anytime it's real world, it's application. Not every real world problem is an app, is a is a rich task model, but that it's a it's a layer of, of application. Does that make sense? At your level we're looking at multi-step. Just because it's a real world problem doesn't make it a true level of application. It has to be a little bit more involved. Norm Webb has these depths of knowledge and, and I think this is where we're starting to see how that type um, type one, type two, type three assessments mirror Norm Webb. So um, he says that the basic recall information, you know, the recall, recognize, use, measure, we don't have as much of that. There are very few standards that say no. Most of them say no and apply and use, which means we're not stopping at the knowledge level. Where when we look at textbooks, when they ask them to identify things, that's the knowledge level. Very few of our standards are actually at the depth, the depth of knowledge for one. Most of them are two, three, and beyond. You know, two. So two is saying that we're looking at classifying, organizing, estimating, collecting, doing things. They're much more um, interactive, much more engaging kinds of activities. Comparing, make up, making observations. So the type one assessments could include some of depth of knowledge one, but type two and type three are all two, three, and beyond. Two, three, four. Okay. You've seen this before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not. Okay, so yeah. no, we haven't. You haven't. Okay, so when we look at designing assessments, I think the first thing we need to look at is okay, go read the standard. What modalities are referenced in the standard? <coughs> Does it say anything about tables and <coughs> diagrams and graphs? How many re modalities are referenced? If it says multiple, ref you know, multiple modes, that's a conceptual expectation because they expect them to flow between representations. If they're only calling out one mode of representation, it's more of a procedural expectation. They want them to graph. Okay, then let's do the procedure of graphing. Then we need to think about, so what's the appropriate format for my assessment? Would it be better as a classroom teacher to do this with an observation? Like, do I actually want to watch them do the procedure of graphing? Or do I look at the results of their work? I like watching them work. I like eavesdropping. I think that's so much richer than looking at the product. You know, we're looking at kind of causal data and effect data, where causal data is the work that's done to lead to the product. I like to see both. Um, I, I think that it, we oftentimes just look at product data and we don't, we can get the answer. 
answer, but our process is completely flawed. Um, at the kindergarten level, I, I have a couple videos that I show teachers about the counting process, because kindergarten is so huge in counting. And I have two videos of, of two kids who both, they were supposed to be counting 33 objects, or 32 objects. Both of them got the answer 33. One of them got, you know, infatuated by the fact that he was being videotaped and lost track of one object, and he, you know, he, he didn't move, but he said a number. The other child made up a whole new number system and, and made a new number called 2010, um, as, so they're not the same kid. If we looked at the result of their work, that they both got 33, they would be in the same group. But when we, we watch the video, clearly they do not belong in the same group, because one gets counted. He just was infatuated by the camera. And the other child does not know the sequence, does not understand, you know, place value if they're making up a number called 2010. So I think observation is important. I think we need to watch and listen and eavesdrop, not just look at the work. That's, you know, make a short story long, I guess. Um, I think we need to figure out what are the appropriate tools or graphics that we'll get at the whatever the goal is of that standard, whether it's the concept or the procedure or the application. We have to design some kind of a tool to collect that data, whether it's a rubric, if it's a rich task, whether it's a checklist, if it's an observation. I like to call this, I'm, I'm gonna show you a skeleton tool that I think is really helpful when we're trying to design a paper and pencil kind of an assessment, because it's a tool that lets the kids analyze their own data, which I totally believe that people who do the most work are the ones who do the most learning, let them analyze their own data, they can set their own goals. So I like skeletons. We're gonna be making skeletons, you know, I think, if they like them. And then we design our tasks. So we figure out, you know, what's the best format, what's the best tools, what's our best way to approach this kind of assessment, then we make the assessment. Does that make sense? Okay, so I wanna pause now, because I threw a lot at you so far, and give you some time to reflect. How does norm web relate to this process? How do the modes relate to this process? How does conceptual procedural application relate to this process? So let's turn and talk for a couple minutes.